My name is Sanjay Gupta. I'm a consultant cardiologist in York. Today I wanted to talk to you about a very interesting test which is easily available which can tell us a lot about our future risk of heart disease. So let's get started. Okay, cardiovascular disease is the biggest cause of morbidity and mortality in the Western world. And despite all the advances in medical practice, the burden continues to increase. As a doctor, I have realized that there are several problems with the way we healthcare professionals do things, which probably contributes to the increasing prevalence of cardiovascular complications. Firstly, a lot of the emphasis on the management of a condition is based on treating the condition and a less emphasis is placed on preventing the condition from developing in the first place. Unfortunately, once the condition has developed, more often than not, it is impossible to reverse it. And then you spend all your time managing its complications. This is the equivalent of covering a problem with a sticking plaster and hoping that the problem will go away rather than examining and addressing the root cause of the problem. Secondly, the markers we use to diagnose a condition are late markers or may be even the wrong markers altogether. For example, in diabetes, we use blood sugar levels or HbA1c as the test for diagnosing diabetes. Unfortunately, there are now several studies which show that up to 26% of newly diagnosed diabetics have already got evidence of kidney disease, 24% have evidence of lower extremity disease, 12% have eye disease, 17% have cardiovascular disease. So if you are using a marker to diagnose a condition because you want to prevent complications, but by the time that marker has helped you make the diagnosis, a quarter of your patients have already developed the complications of the condition, and many of these complications develop over a number of years, then clearly we are relying on a very unsophisticated or even a wrong marker to make the diagnosis. Surely you would expect that a better marker would be that which picks up the condition before the complications develop. So why do we continue to persevere with using HbA1c as a test to diagnose diabetes? The answer is because we are told to. This is what the guidelines say and we are protocol bound doctors and many of us have lost the ability to think for ourselves anymore. So in essence, someone tells us to jump and we spend our whole lives jumping and comparing how high we're jumping with each other and criticizing those people who are not ju jumping high enough. No one stops and says, actually, why are you telling us to jump? Unfortunately, the guidelines are based around managing populations, not individuals, and always have a cost effectiveness agenda. So doctors have assumed a number as the be all and end all determinant of whether you have a harmful process or not when it is so obvious that the number does not pick up the harmful process just as it is beginning, but instead the number rises somewhere in the middle of the course of that harmful process. What this means is that there may be a number of people out there who have a harmful process going on in their bodies without knowing about it, and they are falsely assured by their doctor that they don't have the condition because the number has not risen above a certain defined threshold. It is also bemusing to me to note that the man-made threshold and th that the man-made threshold and those man-made goalposts are shifted every year. The third thing, even though the number is a poor guide to the process, we then spend all our time treating the number or making the number look prettier without really seeing whether our treatment is reversing the process. In diabetes, a lot of our effort is about making the HbA1c numbers appear nicer. But actually, this strategy has not been shown to actually prevent some of the macrovascular complications of diabetes, such as heart attacks and strokes. So we use the wrong marker and we spend our time treating this wrong marker. So is it really a surprise when the burden of complications continues to increase? As the whole of the medical fraternity now has become protocol-centered rather than being patient-centered, 
it becomes important that patients take matters within their own hands and try and educate themselves so that they can advocate for themselves and ask for those tests which may allow us to look for harmful processes within our body rather than relying on the crude tests that medical professionals are advocating. Today, I wanted to talk to you about a really interesting test that we should be using more often, but we don't. And this test is called microalbuminuria. Now, most cardiovascular diseases are caused by harmful processes occurring within our blood vessels. Any harmful process that is occurring in our bodies is most likely to affect our most tiny, most fragile blood vessels first. And if the process remains unchecked, then the damage will extend to our bigger blood vessels. So if we want to pick up signs of early vascular disease, signs of an early harmful process in our bodies, we have to examine our most fragile blood vessels first. There are two particular places where we can get a good understanding of our vascular health. Firstly, the eyes. We can visualize our tiniest, most fragile blood vessels by looking at the retina at the back of our eyes. Similarly, our kidneys also contain a very dense population of tiny blood vessels. Whilst we can't directly visualize the blood vessels in the kidneys, we know that they contribute to overall kidney health. And if they start getting damaged, then the kidneys will start leaking out various substances that would not have leaked out if they were completely healthy. One of the substances that is leaked out when the kidneys are malfunctioning is protein or albumin. Now, if you measure the albumin and 24-hour urine collection of a healthy person, the levels are generally less than 15 milligrams over 24 hours. Anything between 15 to 30 is considered high normal. Anywhere between 30 to 300 milligrams is considered in a range known as microalbuminuria. And anything above 300 is considered macroalbuminuria. Unfortunately, a lot of doctors rely on the dipstick of urine, so they dipstick the urine to look for protein in the urine. But this dipstick will only pick up macroalbuminuria. It is not very good at picking up microalbuminuria because the amount of protein in microalbuminuria in the urine in microalbuminuria is less than the threshold for the urine dipstick. And this is why you have to have specific tests for microalbuminuria. And this is usually a 24-hour urinary collection, specifically looking to measure urinary microalbumin levels. There is a lot of data now to suggest that the presence of microalbuminuria identifies a higher risk subgroup of patients. Now, there was a very famous study called HOPE. HOPE stands for Health Outcomes Prevention Study. In this, there was a sub-study which showed that increased albumin levels predicted mortality in patients who were at high cardiovascular risk. What do I mean by high cardiovascular risk? These people were above the age of 55 and they had cardiovascular disease or they had diabetes and another cardiovascular disease uh, risk, such as hypertension. So when you look at these people, all-cause mortality was 9.4% amongst patients without microalbuminuria compared to 18.2%, double, in those people who were found to have microalbuminuria. In fact, there is some evidence to suggest that even people with high normal albumin level, microalbumin levels have a higher risk of cardiovascular outcomes compared to those that have normal urinary albumin levels. So if your, prote if your kidneys are leaking protein, even if that protein is slightly elevated, and they're doing so on a consistent basis that something is wrong. And we see this relationship in patients with diabetes, patients without diabetes, patients with hypertension, and even patients in the general population. The more protein you're passing in your urine, the greater your overall risk. And that could be even high normal albumin levels in the urine, but certainly microalbuminuria, which is this range between 30 and 300 milligrams. There was a very interesting study called PREVEND, P-R-E-V-E-N-D. This was done in Holland. And in this study, 40,548 patients were between the ages of 28 and 75 were sent a questionnaire. And they were also sent a vial to collect their urine so that you could measure their urine albumin levels. And the investigators found a very clear relationship between 
albumin in the urine and all-cause cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular death. In terms of cardiac disease, there have been studies, including one which was called the Strong Heart Study, which showed that there was a significant association between microalbuminuria and abnormalities of cardiac function. In addition, patients who have high blood pressure and have microalbuminuria are likely to have a thicker, stiffer heart. Other studies have indicated that even in asymptomatic diabetic patients, the presence of microalbuminuria is associated with a higher likelihood of heart disease and suffocation of heart cells on exertion. So these people are at a higher risk of coronary disease, a higher risk of ischemic heart disease. There is also data suggesting that elevated microalbumin levels are associated with strokes and even a worse outcome from strokes. So if you have a stroke, and you have high microalbumin levels, your outcome is gonna be worse from the stroke than if you don't have elevated microalbumin levels. And although I don't really have a study to back me up, I'm willing to bet that patients with elevated microalbumin levels will have a higher risk of developing cognitive dysfunction and dementia later in life. Watch this space because this will come out. I'm pretty confident of this. So what this tells us is that microalbuminuria can precede the appearance of hypertension and diabetes and can independently predict cardiovascular, resist, uh, cardiovascular risk. It may also help stratify patients with conditions such as diabetes and hypertension into those people who are high risk and those people who are intermediate or slightly lower risk. It is actually a very simple and inexpensive test and in an ideal world should be offered to most people. Um, unfortunately, it isn't, even though if you go to your general practitioner, he will know about microalbumin and he can happily check your microalbumin levels for you. What we still don't know is whether strategies to suppress the microalbuminuria offer greater benefit compared to just treating the other risk factors. What I mean is that if you see microalbuminuria, you should obviously be more aggressive with lifestyle intervention, control of diabetes and hypertension. But do drugs that actually reduce the microalbumin levels offer greater protection? Well, in the PREVENDIT study, P-R-E-V-E-N-D-IT -E -E trial, it was found that lowering the albuminuria by using a class of drugs called ACE inhibitors, these are drugs like Ramipril, Perindopril, and Allopril, this was actually cardioprotective. So, if you are found to have microalbuminuria, what should you do? Well, microalbumin tells you at an early stage that for some reason your body is not happy and therefore, one, you have to be more aware and two, two you have to be more aggressive about curtailing those things in your lifestyle that could be making your body unhappy. So if you are found to have microalbumin levels and you're overweight, try and work on your nutrition. If you're not getting enough exercise, make sure you get more exercise. If you're not, adequate, not getting adequate amounts of sleep or if you're working too hard and too stressed, then these are all signs the body is giving you at an early stage before something bad happens that your body is not happy. And this is the time when people can do something to try and prevent their future risk of something bad happening to them. So what do you do? More aggressive lifestyle management, more exercise, reducing or stopping smoking, uh, reduction in dietary salt, weight loss, ensuring you're getting good quality sleep, stress management. Number two, if you have high blood pressure, if you have hypertension and you're found to have microalbuminuria, that truly tells you that that blood pressure is high for you uh, and therefore more aggressive blood pressure control. So even if my numbers were okay within normal limits, but I were found to have microalbuminuria, I'd be even more aggressive. Whereas if someone's numbers were higher, but they didn't have microalbuminuria, I'd be less aggressive. So I'm less depending on just the number, but more uh, dependent on the overall assessment of my cardiovascular risk. Again, if you're diabetic, more aggressive diabetic control. If you have elevated cholesterol levels, more uh, aggressive management. And then, of course, there are medications like ACE inhibitors and um, angiotensin receptor blockers, which have been shown to protect the kidneys and probably protect the heart, especially in diabetic patients when there is microalbuminuria. So I hope you found this useful. Um, I'm really interested in doing a survey, so I'll put up a poll on my community page about microalbuminuria, whether you found this video useful. And those people who are then inspired by this video to go and ask their GP for a microalbumin levels, I'd be really interested in knowing what proportion of patients 
are found to have elevated microalbumin levels because that I think it just tells you about stuff that's going on in your body. We don't need to wait for something bad to happen to then be made aware that there was something going on in our body. We need to know beforehand so we can do responsible things, make responsible changes and thereby reduce our risk. So um, once again, thank you so much for um, uh, watching. I am always grateful for uh, the amazing feedback I get. Uh, and the love you show me. Um, I think this thing about microalbumin is really, really important. And I think it would be great if, if you find that there's someone who may benefit from watching this video, who may then become better informed about their own health, then if you would consider sharing it, then it would mean a ton to me because I definitely think that we cannot rely on medical professionals to get us better um, because the thinking is so narrow now you know everyone is sort of no one's thinking out of the box no one is thinking about going beyond what protocol tells them to uh, and health services all over are just going down uh, massively so for patients to be educated for patients to feel empowered if i can achieve that then that would make me really happy and that was the reason i started the channel so um, once again thank you so much i wish you all the best take care